Hey guys, this is Frank Decker, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alex Overeem. Hi, this is Stefan Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. DJ Dillashaw. You're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to the six-year anniversary episode of Submission Radio. That's right, it's episode 204. We're here on the 25th of March. Dennis Skaratov here with Kasper Zalowski. Six years down the track, Cas. Six years down the track, and we are back and still going with another episode of Submission Radio, man. Where does time fly? I can't believe it, dude. This show has been so crazy to us for all these years, taking us... I want to say all around the world, predominantly the United States, uh, but just covering some of the biggest events, the biggest UFCs in the world, from Conor McGregor cars to, you know, Robert Whitaker versus Israel Adesanya, you know, the, the BMF title, and uh, literally just, you know, you and me to this day, uh, from the very beginning, just a couple of guys with a, with a couple of microphones interviewing people, uh, you know, from all around the world. I still remember us working those shitty, shitty office jobs in the very beginning, waking up at like five in the morning. I'm laying in my bed in my underwear interviewing people like, you know, Randy Couture and all these people thinking, Jesus, if only they knew where we were right now and what we were doing and, and the lives that were, we were leading to, you know, six years later to, well, you know, be, 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 be somewhat successful. And, uh, but definitely, definitely, you know, getting a lot of memories and a lot of uh, interviews in the process and all really thanks to you guys, the listeners, uh, you know, for tuning in and supporting us. Yeah, absolutely, man. So many great moments, so many great memories, so many great guests. Uh, if you guys do have like a favorite moment over the last six years that stands out to you, definitely throw them down in the comment sections below. But you wouldn't believe it. I mean, you know, me and Cass, we interview a few people every week. It, it just, to me, Cass, it just feels like a blur. Like I yeah. try to break it down in my mind, like episode by episode. Mm. But I think because we do so much prep for every show, as soon as the show's done, it's kind of like that part of my brain's deleted and yeah. the next... One stats later, yeah, but I'd love to hear some thoughts on people's favorite interviews and moments of the last six years. Throw them in the comment section below. And again, like Cash said, a big thank you to all of you for tuning in, supporting us, and, and being there for us and making it possible to push through these six six years. Certainly, you know, it's not something we don't think about time. Like, it's, it's just something that happens where you're like, whoa, six years. Because yeah. I guess, the, yeah, it's not like we're like, oh, can't wait for a six. And then, you know, you message me right before we do the episode, like yesterday and go, hey, it's our six year. And it's like, whoa, I can't believe it, man. It's absolutely unbelievable that time flies so quickly. We've been able to uh, speak to so many great people and meet so many great fans. Well, it's like the channel at the moment has 140, no, I think going on 141,000 subscribers any day now. Uh, so like 141,000 of you guys, and it's all thanks to you. But like there are people, someone commented, I think last week on the episode being like, hey, I've been a subscriber since like 5K, since you guys had 5,000 wow. subscribers. And it's like, how many years ago is that to, to picture that, you know, you guys have been listening to us ramble on about stuff and talking to people for, for that long is just insane. It's like there's a, there's a Rolodex now of like numbers and contacts and people, some that we haven't spoken to in years, but you think, man, remember when that person was, was on the show? Remember when that person was on the program? So I don't know, not, not, to, not to make too big of a thing out of it, but just want to say a massive thank you, obviously to you guys, but also like all the media members and all the media outlets that have, you know, given us a chance and, and write articles on, on our stuff, you know, week to week. Like, honestly, it's, it's because of you guys that we've sort of got, you know, even, even any shred of success. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the people that actually appear on the program, the fighters that, you know, give us their time and all the guests and all the journalists that come on the program all the time. is just, oh, what a, what a wild ride, man. What a wild ride. And we, and it, we, we continue the trend because we've got a bunch of juicy, sexy guests uh, on the program right. for you this week. The the show rolls on, coronavirus or no coronavirus. We are here to to help take your mind off things and hopefully be a, be a bit of entertainment. We've got Sean O'Malley coming to the program. We've got Francis Ngannou. We've got the delightful, the always delightful Brett Okamoto. Sean O'Malley, I feel like has been a long time coming. We've been wanting him on the program for a long time, and uh, he's just a fun guy in these crazy times, you know. Uh, you know, he's, I want to get his story on the first time he ever got high. I want to get his story on these Tony Ferguson training videos, obviously reflecting on his last fight and just sort of where his career is going to be moving forward in uh, in in 2020, and then obviously Francis Ngannou supposed to be fighting. 
uh, Rosenstrike just, you know, days from now, but obviously been sidelined because of this whole coronavirus epidemic. So I want to get his thoughts on, you know, the heavyweight division, Tyson Fury and a whole bunch of things. And then Brett Okamoto to sort of discuss, you know, just the latest happenings in this uh, UFC and, and MMA environment. So it's a juicy show. And also I feel like it's good that Sean and Francis both making their submission radio debuts on a six year anniversary. So mm. it's like six years ago, submission radio didn't exist. And then all of a sudden it did. The whole show was a debut. And now we've got new debuts on this program so it's all peachy yeah man it's all full circle exactly right listen and we're around because of some great sponsors and people that support the show as mm. well before we get to the sponsor cast because i'm really excited to talk about th this new company that we're working with just a quick shout out to everybody out there dealing with this whole coronavirus thing listen we're there with you uh i think it's important to stay positive i think it's important to turn the news off you know it's important to be updated on what's happening but it's pretty obvious now that the news is just trying to get a bunch of clicks and a bunch of a bunch of panic going for a lot of people. So definitely know what the facts are. Definitely self-isolate and keep a safe distance from everybody and don't risk anybody's life. But once you know the facts, I reckon turn it off. Get your day going. Make sure to have some fun. Make sure to make the most of it, you know. It's not what we wanted, but look, it's a, it's a vacation we didn't plan, but it's a vacation that we've got. So don't forget to binge watch. Don't forget to relax. Don't forget to disconnect from the craziness that's happening out there. And know that we're all in it with you. Obviously, our DMs, our messages. I've always been open on social media. If you need a chat, if you need a comment, if you want to say hi, we're there for you guys. We're right there with you. And even though it's happening all over the world, and we're in Australia, it's a small world these, day, these days, Cass. So we're not far for, from all of our listeners and friends and here for, for everybody during this tough time. Oh, and don't for one second think they're like, yeah, but you're submission radio. You guys are in the media. You guys are like, you know, living your ivory towers. Uh, I, I think you'd be very shocked, especially like Dennis, you were telling me about your day yesterday and just some of the crazy shit that you went through. And, you know, we're, we're, like you mentioned, we are all in this together. And if you think submission radio don't need a bit of help from the government and help from, you know, here and there and things to deal with this, um, you know, you would be mistaken. So we're, we're definitely in this together. You did mention, though, you did mention uh, the sponsor. Dude, sometimes, like you have sponsorship opportunities and, and you just feel like it's not necessarily the right fit. Other times you have the dream sponsor that you just think would you, you would love to work with and then it happens. I've had this wallet for a number of years, right? It is, it is the Ridge wallet. I think going on like five years now, it has been with me through some of the biggest events in UFC history, and that's not hyperbole. UFC 205, when Conor McGregor beat Eddie Alvarez to become the champ champ, the Ridge Wallet was there. Uh, Diaz versus McGregor 2, that crazy wall, the Ridge Wallet was there. Jones versus DC, the rematch, the Ridge Wallet was there. Khabib versus Conor. What what a milestone of any UFC history. The Ridge Wallet was there. Whitaker and Adesanya. Masvidal versus Diaz at UFC 244. With The Rock in New York. Connor versus Cowboy most recently. This has been my wallet for a number of years because it's so small. It's so streamlined. And I got sick of those massive, you know, a lot of people have these big black or brown leather wallets. And they, they look almost like suitcases. You pull in the old George Costanza. You can barely sit on it. It's giving you the back pain. And the Ridge Wallet, it's, it's so small. It's so streamlined. All you need is really your cards in here and it even has a cash strap i know that i don't really carry cash around but when we go to the states and we get the the bills you guys have your little dollar bills and we get like you know a thousand dollars exchanged in foreign currency it can even slip in here in this nice little cash strap and these guys hit us up about doing potential sponsorship and i just thought this is this is the dream right here and they were kind enough to send us this bad boy right here this is the brand new carbon fiber ridge wallet new and improved cash strap mm -hmm. And it's it re if if you guys want to see this is my actual wallet right here these are my actual credit cards and driver's license and stuff you just push this thing a little here you know the the cards pop out and then you fan them out and then if you go oh yeah I want uh, say you know my driver's license you just pull it out and it's that simple I've taken it to Thailand to Bali to music festivals to concerts it just sits there in your pocket and uh, it's great knowing that like hey it's so small and so streamlined it's not going to be falling out anyway yeah man no that's absolutely fabulous because these days. I'll tell you, it's tough to get around. I'm in the same boat as you, man, because I don't really carry a wallet around, and this thing is a great sort of way to fix up what I'm dealing with. But also, you know, a few weeks ago, I debuted the Backsack Cast. Oh. You know, I've been walking around with my backpack everywhere I've been going, and this commuter bag from Ridge, it is unbelievable. I'll show you guys this uh, backpack right now, because look at this. This is absolute beauty. So, you know... 
I don't want to. I don't want to trash other brands, Cass. But you and me always laugh at people that have backpacks and they're like forty years old, mm. but it looks like they're about to go to the elementary school. You know those yeah, ones yeah, that yeah, you get yeah. from like Target and stuff mm -hmm. that look cheap and just nasty, and it just doesn't look like something that will go with the outfit. Look at this guy, unbelievable! It looks sleek right here, and not only is it something I could wear like. For example, I've been wearing my backpack whenever I go to appointments now. I've been wearing it whenever I go on hikes. I've been wearing it whenever I go uh, to travel and interstate. This thing right here, and I'll open it up just real quick. I love to, uh, I have to take my stuff out of it just so you guys can check it out. But this thing right here, it has space for the Submission Radio Nintendo Switch, which uh, gets played oh, on the regular. Yeah. It has uh, zips right here where I don't have to worry about water getting in, which is absolutely fantastic because sometimes you drop it in the bathroom sometimes you drop it on your hikes and also over here on the side a nifty little device here if i want to have my uh power bank plugged in which people that know me know i get a phone that doesn't work i don't want to trash it too badly but the battery stuffed so i'm always carrying around my battery pack boom right there from the bag i can plug it right in i don't have to worry about it one of the issues i've always had is i'd plug in my power bank into my phone but i have to put the cable through kind of like the zip and it gets disconnected and it wasn't charging the whole time and then it dies on me don't have to experience that with, with this bag cast so it's unbelievable um it's actually solved a lot of the problems that i've had before it's lightweight durable it's got a rip stop shell so just perfect for any everyday thing that I need to do or even if I need to take it overseas or on the hikes that I've been doing lately because of this coronavirus. Well, there you go. I know you guys are Jones in for us to get to our sexy, juicy guests and uh, we don't want to delay, but I'll just quickly say this, right? These Ridge products, this Ridge wallet, right? Free worldwide shipping and returns. It's a lifetime guarantee if you love it and free returns if you don't. Over 30,000 five-star reviews. Um, titanium, carbon fiber. This to me is like the, the Rolls Royce of wallets right here. Carbon fiber. Mm -hmm a brand new design uh but they've got aluminium and if you don't want a black one that's fine they've got like burnt metal they've got all sorts of funky you know colorful ones as well so there's sort of one for everybody and um you can use the code submission go to ridge.com forward slash submission that's the personal link the good people at ridge are not only supporting us but we've got the personal link for you guys use the code submission and you get 10 percent off i tested it yesterday and it absolutely works so especially in a crazy time now when everybody's trying to save as much money as possible uh the 10 percent helps you a lot so ridge.com forward slash submission check it out now without further ado we do have a whole bunch of guests uh, sean o'malley francis gunner brett okamoto gonna be chatting to brett first to kick off the program remember if you're going through a tough time dm us message us at submission radio you can follow us on all social media without further ado it's time to get the show rolling. Our first guest is on the line waiting patiently. Dennis, I believe you're about to introduce him. All right, guys. Our next guest is not one of the wimpy media guys Dana White was referring to bringing some sunshine into our lockdown lives. This man is the key to the coronavirus cure with scientists studying his blood for the big vaccine. The antidote himself, Brett Okamoto. Welcome to Submission Radio. Look at you. People having coronavirus. I feel like you look better and better every time we speak to you. I was really trying to think of the, the nice things you were going to say about me during the lead up. And I didn't think anecdote to the coronavirus was going to be in there. So you continue to uh, pleasantly surprise me, guys. Well, we had to bounce back from the Okamoto's 11 after you, 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 you panned it. Panned you poo pooed it, Brett. Poo pooed. <laughs> and look at that. Now, now, now the... The fountains in Las Vegas, they're not even, I don't think they're even functioning at the moment. We saw the sad pictures of the strip being shut down. What, what is the feeling like there at the moment, Brett? I mean, it's probably the same as, as, as everywhere, man. Uh, everything's closed down. And the, the, strip, the strip is significant, though, in that, like, it's kind of like, a, I would say even, and maybe this is just because I live here, but it, it's, it's, it's even more so, I think, than, than some of the other ones, big ones that you would think about, like Times Square in New York. The strip mm. never closes, man. I mean, I've been in Times Square late at night, and things are closed. I mean, they, they yeah. still got it lit up, but, you know, you, you're looking for a beer, you're looking for food, you're looking for, you know, hanging out with people. Like, like that thing does close down. Like, Vegas never closes. You know, I mean, Vegas is, like, just getting going at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. So, like, to, to see everything just completely shut down, like, that's never happened. And I don't know if it... I hope it never happens again, you know, so and, and plus just knowing that it's the lifeline of this city, that so many people's, you know, livelihoods and well-being is connected to that that specific strip, you know, and, and a lot of jobs down there, of course. 
it's sad, man. It does have an emotional toll on, on this city to see that, you know, that, that all, all these people come in from around the world to enjoy that. And, and, mm. you know, this area benefits from that and, and, and sort of uh, relies on it to an extent. It is, it's, there's, it's emotional for, for the people in Vegas. Yeah, absolutely, man. And we do appreciate you coming on the show and sort of distracting everybody from the craziness of, of everyday life all over the world right now. It's absolutely brutal for so many people, for everyone. But I mean, the MMA world is no different. Uh, we saw Nevada State Athletic Commission sort of had to cancel their hearing due to the ongo ongoing pandemic. They were supposed to vote on when the events would be back, no longer suspended. What, what do you make of the hearing that's supposed to determine, you know, when events are going to be back being canceled itself? Because of the coronavirus, I mean, where are we at with that? And is there another meeting that will take place from what you understand? Yeah, I mean, the um, the perception of that is not necessarily a positive one, right? I mean, it's it's almost in some ways it's got some comedy to it, right? That they're supposed to have this this meeting to talk about how we're going to end up moving forward, and then the meeting gets canceled, like as to you said, because of what's going on. But I. I didn't take that as as, a, as necessarily a huge, huge deal, just because I just don't think that that Nevada Athletic Commission was going to be in a position where they had any answers for us anyway. You know, I, I would have been really surprised. And, you know, granted, I have been surprised at commission meetings before, but I'd be really surprised if they had. I mean, it, what are they going to do? Set another date? And what does that date mean? Like, we don't, we just don't know. We don't know where this thing is heading. We don't know how it's going to continue to impact Vegas. I mean, Vegas, as I just got done saying, you know, they have bigger issues right now, as every city does, but they're not going to be talking about putting on fights in front of no fans that is really not pulling in any revenue um, because there's no there's no receipt. There's no gate receipts at a time when the government is working overboard to to to, you know, address some, some much more serious problems. So I I don't think that the cancellation of, of the meeting is, is a huge deal because I don't think we're going to have a strong resolution anyway. Now, one thing that I think that, that the commission should be talking about is that I do I do feel like they can be in a position where they can help get this sport going um, because because they are Nevada and because the UFC has made it very clear that, you know, they want to hold these events at the Apex Center, that they understand that logistically with everything going on, it's going to be very difficult to do what they normally do and go around the, the world. But if they could get going again in Vegas, and I do believe that that would be probably the best way to, to, to pick business back up because you just have so many more different things you can you can control. Now, you still have to get a lot of people into Vegas, and that to me is just a, a hurdle that I just don't know how they get over. That to me is the most difficult one. But once you have them in Vegas, I think the UFC with its resources and its its you know knowledge of the area and, and, and what, what it has available to them in Vegas, that they can have some type of control over, let's test the athletes, Let's make sure that they're only, you know, with themselves. It's basically like running a, a, a tough season, you know, like like get everybody that's in the tough seat house, put them in the tough house. They're mm -hmm. not going to be leaving. They're not going to be infected by anybody, anyone else. And we have actually our own facility where we can have these events. It's not even a facility that we're we're renting from someone else. It's it's under our complete control. I, I would love to see, and I know the UFC would love to see a situation in which the athletic commission can at least get going to the point that they can start resuming these fights in vegas because i think that that would really accelerate the timetable of, of of when they're actually putting on events on a regular basis again mm, COVID 19 house i like the sound of it brett just just quickly i mean one of the big uh, headlines <laughs> down here and i just want to get your thoughts on it uh, obviously your way donald trump is saying uh, there's that 15 day uh lockdown that you guys are doing then after that he wants to see you know churches full of people for thanksgiving and he wants the economy back in the swing of things. Do you think that might open up the doors to MMA retu returning sooner and possibly doing something like that than what we anticipate? I, mean, I have my own thoughts on how realistic it is to have churches full of people on Easter <laughs> in, uh, in, in less than three weeks. So, I mean, if that were to come to fruition, of course, it would, it would help the situation with the sport. I, I don't know if that's going to end up happening. But I will say that, that having the U.S. government talk about things of that nature and we do know that dana white has a pipeline to donald mm -hmm. trump at the very least what that does is it gives him some info inside information i think that he can use to his benefit on when some time frames that he can put things together realistically and some ideas of where at least you know president trump believes this country will be at some point again i don't know how realistic those those predictions are right now but 
any optimism that the government is having over here and that is and that is of course being shared with the ufc i would think that yeah it would um it would help them mobilize quicker and help them prepare some things behind the scenes that maybe we don't even know about because, because yeah, Dana White and Donald Trump are buddies. I mean, we know that. And uh, I'm sure that they're staying in, in, in pretty frequent communication. I mean, you mentioned predictions just before, if, if you had to predict and, and you, you may already know uh, the location of this Tony and Khabib fight, where exactly it's going to take place. I mean, I, I think at this point it's, it's pretty much known it's not going to be in the in the United States. Um, and also, do you think this fight should be happening? I think I think that's one of the debates, like not so much whether it can logistically happen, whether it should be happening, you know, given the climate of, of every, everything that's happening. I think it I think it can happen if every precaution is, is taken. And what I mean by that is I mean, testing, it, you know, you, you can't say like, well, these guys don't have a fever. So, you know, we're good. I, I think that what we know of and you know what i've been reading about you know scientists you know, talking about this thing is that there are people who are asymptomatic so to say that like we're only going to test people who are showing symptoms like that's not good enough if you, if you want to put on a show like this i think you have to test for the specific virus and and you you lower the scale of, of everything you like i was talking about earlier if they were to be able to have these cards in vegas if there is a way to test people court basically quarantine them off get get them to a to a, a location where they're all together and again you've tested them all you've made sure that they don't have this i i mean i i i know how much could be and, and tony want this fight you know and, and i know that that it's a big it's a big opportunity for Khabib, of course, but also for Tony. You know, I mean, this is the biggest money-making opportunity of his career. It was one that he was robbed of two years ago, a freak accident, you know, tripping over a, a, a cable. If there is a way to get Tony Ferguson this fight that he has deserved for years and this payday that he has deserved for years, like, I'm, I'm open to it. You know, like, I, I think that that does get taken into consideration. And if the UFC can guarantee that they're testing people, putting them in a controlled environment, you know, transport them, transporting them together and then having them fight, you know, it, I, I think that that's, that's feasible. And, I, and I, I'm not so sure that I can be totally against it if all of those boxes are checked. If those boxes are not checked and we're, and it's still sort of this cavalier approach where it's like, you got to get out there and live your life. You know, you got, you, we're, we're, we're doing, we're doing this, you know, like coronavirus be damned. Like, like that is not an acceptable, like, like I can't personally get, on board with that and quite frankly i just don't think that's good for the ufc brand i mean i look at what the ufc's done and and the ufc's response to this as a dana white response you know and, and i have a, a real good understanding of the type of individual that dana white is i think you guys do too and as crazy as it sounds where it's like well why would this guy you know go to all these measures and and, and to save these events it, it's, it's just how how dana is man i mean he sees a challenge and he attacks it he, he attacks mm. it like personally like vendettedly, you know, and, and, and so that's why these guys are, are, are acting, I think, in the way that they are. And we can have a long conversation about whether it's right or not. But but if they can do it in a controlled, smart, safe way, then then I don't have a problem with this fight going on and seeing these guys make the money that, that they're scheduled to make. Mm. And I want to find out from you what kind of money you think this is going to draw. But just quickly, if th this thing does happen and someone does catch uh, COVID-19, a staff member, a member of the team, and it's from that UFC 249 experience. How bad do you think that could be for the brand of the UFC? I think it would be really terrible, you know, because you've already got a lot of people against it. I, I was having a conversation uh, um, with someone else about this the other day, and I, I said I could see it really going both ways. I could see it going where, you know, Tony and Khabib, they do it. It's safe. The fight is amazing. And at the end, you know, they hug each other. People are, are, are entertained. It became the end. It would be the story of the sports world, not just for Saturday. It would be for, you know, the 10 days leading up to it. It would be the only thing to talk about. People would really understand why this fight is so important. It would, there would be a lot of conversations being taken place around the world of like, hey, you know, there's, this UFC is going gonna, is gonna to happen. And that would just mm -hmm. drive the conversation of like, well, who are the guys fighting? And so many people would get to learn about Khabib and Tony. And, and what, a, what a great thing, you know, because if anything, all of us in this MMA bubble have been saying, this is the fight that you want to see. And people don't believe us because they're like, no, we want to see Conor McGregor and Khabib Nurmagomedov. It's like, no, you don't. You want to see Khabib and Tony. And so this is a situation to really educate a lot of people. Have a great fight. You can, you know, can you imagine the scenes of like Khabib and Tony saying, you know, we did it for the fans around the world. 
you know, everyone's stuck in their house. Like, like it could be a really uplifting, powerful moment for the UFC. Or mm. if they don't handle it correctly or they're cavalier about it, like I said, um, I think that they open themselves to a, a large amount of criticism. So I, I, I could see it going very two very opposite directions as far as how the brand is received, depending on what happens. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's a it's a massive gamble. I'm just wondering, like, how big do you think this fight would be? Because kind of like you mentioned, at the moment, everybody's at home. No one's really got anything to do. There's no sports. No one's got anything to watch except for like you know Netflix and stuff. So if they put it on, well, you know, here you go. Here's something fresh and new. But at the same time, how do you even get the word out? Because you would assume that there wouldn't even be any media allowed there, and media wouldn't be covering it, and you definitely wouldn't have much international media. So how how big do you think this event would be? You know, pay per view buys wise. You know, if it was to happen. Man, that, that's an interesting question, you know, because at the same time... Uh, and it would be in a different country probably as well. Sorry to jump in. Yeah, different country. Um, and also just the economic impact of this thing around the world. I mean, do people mm. want to spend spend money on a pay-per-view right now? You know, I mean, that it, it people are have bigger things to worry about, you know. But at the same time, I do think that there is a desire to have something else to talk about and to watch. You know, I, I mean, part of part of what would be, I think, like healing or a positive thing for this fight happening is not only the fight itself, but like I said, the week leading up to it, because we would have something else to talk about. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. Like how, how even just, it feels like, I mean, just, I'm talking to me personally, but it feels like I've been in my house for much longer than I have been, you know? And, and I <laughs> yeah. think it's just because we're all focused and talking about one storyline, which as we should, I mean, I, I want to educate myself about this virus and I hope others are doing so, but like, you can really go down that rabbit hole and then all of a sudden before you know it, it's the only thing that you've talked about it's the only thing you've thought about and so this would just it, it would be like this this new topic you know dangling over here that that fight fans could talk about but non-fight fans also could talk about is just like why is this fight still happening what is so important about it oh they're telling me that this is a bigger fight than even if it, if it involved conor mcgregor that's kind of crazy to me because i thought every mm. big fight involved conor mcgregor maybe i should read about this just for 10 minutes of a break from the coronavirus you know and and so i think that people a lot of people around the world would buy into this fight that normally wouldn't but you know like like you mentioned this it's just it's different logistics it's 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 a lack of media coverage i mean the media would still cover it to the best of their ability but i mean you've got two guys who don't really like to do interviews so i don't think that, that all of a sudden could be even tony are going to go out there and do hours and hours and hours of interviews with us. <clears throat> so um, it, it would be interesting. I mean, I, I, I think from a standpoint of it capturing the world's attention, that would happen. As far as it being a blockbuster home run pay-per-view, as far as numbers bought, I don't know. You know, I, I could see I could see a, a couple different scenarios with that. Mm. And obviously the pay you mentioned it before, it's kind of like a boxing model in a lot of ways. It's just when it, I mean, it looks like it's going to be one fight. It could be versus Tony. I don't know if any other fights are going to be on that card. So what, have you heard anything about the negotiations, how much these guys would be making? It seems like it would only, you know, bear to, to, to make logic that these guys would make more money than they would have initially or, or a bigger percentage of the pay-per-view buys seeing as they're the ones taking the risk and they're the ones the only ones fighting on the pay for you possible. Well, Dana, Dana White told me yesterday that that he he wants to keep a full lineup together. Now that's another one that I mm. just like. I just don't see how that's 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 possible. But um, you know, Dana White has pulled off some crazy things before. But let, let's say undercard, no undercard. Um, I actually don't think the undercard makes makes as big of a difference as you potentially mm. do. I I think that uh, I think Khabib from what I understand, and I don't have any specifics I can give you, but I, I he, he has a very good contract, you know, and um, and he is financially, when, when this guy says he doesn't fight for money, I, I really believe him. You know, he fights for other reasons, and I don't think that there would require a lot of negotiations on Khabib's side. I think he wants this fight to happen. I think he's happy with what he makes, and this fight, you know, potentially moving the location of this fight is not um, first and foremost, I think, on his mind. Now, with Tony, you know, he's coming in as a challenger. And I, I do think that depending on where this fight is, that, uh, that of course, you know, it's, it's just natural business that any one of us would be like, okay, so, hey, circumstances have changed a little bit. You know, I've been training in my garage or, or my, my, my facility, and, and I've lost some training partners because of the travel restrictions and everything else. Mm -hmm. I'm still willing to do this, but this is the only fight now in sports. You know, what, what kind of, of conversations can we have about my contract? I would imagine that would, that would happen. Um, 
exactly how that goes and, and what Tony would be able to, to, to talk, talk to them about and what their response to that, that would be, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that everything that I've heard so far is those conversations have not taken place yet. But I would imagine they would. But again, that's depending on where the fight is. I mean, if this fight still somehow were to end up in the U.S. somehow, which I don't think is going to happen, but if it were somehow end up in the U.S., then maybe it's not as, as big of a concern for Tony. So, um, yeah, the, the short answer is I think Khabib is fine. On the other side, you know, Tony might have some, some things to talk about. But at the end of the day, Tony really wants this fight. You know, he, he really wants this fight. And this is a fight that I think that offers a lot of upside to him as well. He wins this fight. He could fight Connor. That could be Breen match is out there for him. I mean, that, I, I would think those types of things would come into his mind as well. That hey, that if, if I win this fight, there's there's a lot of upside after the fact. Mm, absolutely. And it, it would be one of the most histor historic making fights in the history of MMA. So a lot of stuff on the line. Brett, we appreciate your time. Guys, make sure to follow Brett for all the latest MMA news at B Okamoto ESPN on Twitter. Brett, we, uh, we we look forward to seeing what's next. We appreciate you bringing some sunshine into our lockdown lives. It's always an honor having you on the program. Look at oh, this. It's, it's, it's like it's we're in bed with Brett Okamoto. Look at this. Very huge guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fans <this>. only. <laughs> I love, love wow. you both. Take care out there. I'll see you real soon, all right? <laughs> Stay safe, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. All the best, man. We'll speak to you soon. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. All right, guys. Making a Submission Radio debut, this man made a statement when he made his long away to return at UFC 248 with a first-round TKO finish. Apart from that, he has entertained us all with his videos, including his Tony Ferguson-inspired workouts during this lockdown the man we need in a time like this, Sugar Sean O'Malley. Welcome for the very first time to Submission Radio. Thank you for joining us, man. How are you? Yeah, th yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. Dude, we are happy to have you. Look at that. We're in the we're in the Twitch room right now. We feel yeah. honored to have you uh, on the program in the room. Before we get into it, we have enjoyed watching your Tony Ferguson workout vids. Uh, I think they've Thank been putting you. on. Well, I was gonna say they've been putting on a smile on a lot of people's faces when things are tough. Tell us, when did you decide? It was time to unleash the Sugar Sean workouts on people. I was just, uh, I think I was just, um, just happened. I was just like, it, it just all came, it was like just organically happened. I think the night before, I think I was just high and I was just thinking how funny it would be if I just <laughs> kind of did a bunch. So we were training the next morning at, Tim, at my buddy Tim's gym and, uh, I said, record this. I'm just going to hit do a bunch of random shit. Just first take, hit it. And <laughs> it was just funny as shit. And you absolutely nailed it. What did, what did you think when you uh, when you first saw Tony Ferguson's Tony Ferguson workout, the original Tony Ferguson with, with the pants and, and the wrestling slants? And were you high then when you were watching that one as well? <laughs> I don't know. He's I like Tony Ferguson. A lot of people thought I was mocking oh, yeah. him. Or make, like, I just think, I think Tony Ferguson's a badass. How could you? How could you not with his resume and you know he's fighting Habib next so mm -hmm. no I'm actually a huge Tony fan like him a lot respect him a lot and uh I just did it because he's gotta know that it looks goofy when he does that shit but so he <laughs> I'm sure he just thought it was I bet if he saw it he, he, he thought it was funny um definitely wasn't making fun of him or anything he's just goofing around well we were gonna ask has he reached out or said anything to you about the videos or his management team or anyone from his team no, he hasn't. I, I sat next to him at one of the UFC fights like a, a long time ago, and, and he was super cool. Um, we didn't talk much. It was more like, hey, what's up? You know, but uh, I don't think there's any beef there. I don't think he thought saw that video and thought I was doing any, any disrespect. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually, you know, when this, when this whole pandemic is over, the big video obviously has to be you and Tony doing a crazy workout <laughs> together. That's got to be like the dream, right? <laughs> Yeah, we might make it happen. We could probably think of that. Mm, uh, Tony is a regular guest here on the show, and uh, he, he checks out the program from time to time. If he's watching this, what's your message to him? To Tony? Mm. Mm. Shit, Get this workout together. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to hit, uh, hit one of those crazy workouts. No, I heard I heard Chael Sonnen's crazy stories about Tony just doing a full workout. Everyone's exhausted, and he's over hitting the bag. So, you know, it's, I like to, you know, that's kind of like, that's just championship mindset. That's that's the kind of mindset that I want to have. So, yeah, just Tony's a beast. Mm, absolutely. 
love us some Tony Ferguson. Obviously, I want to get your thoughts on some of the things happening uh, with his fight in a moment. But obviously, you know, your big return happened at UFC 248, and it was so close to the pandemic and, you know, one of the last cards oh. before everything got shut down. And that's the thing. People were waiting for the Sugar Show for so long, and there were so many delays. Do you think about the fact that, like, man, it, had you been on, say, the Tony and Khabib card, which is going to be, you know, theoretically big card, that, you know, you, you may still be waiting to make your return? Ooh, I know. I feel like everyone's freaking out, like getting quarantined. And I, I just, I feel like I would be more of a, like stressed out about all this stuff, but coming off, coming off that win, I'm just like training once, training once a day and then streaming a couple times a day, just hanging out and life's been good. But yeah, if that would have happened in my cart, my fight got pulled, like I would have had to do some serious, you know, so serious, uh, digging inside to be okay with that. But I'm glad it, I'm glad I was able to perform. Mm, I mean, it was a miraculous uh, return, and I think a lot of people were just so happy to see you back. Now that it's been a little bit of time since UFC 248, how would you sum up that week and your impressive finish over Jose? Yeah, it was it, it went perfect. Not a lot of you know, not a lot of times you can look back and say that was pretty much a perfect fight camp. You know, I dealt with injuries. There was times where I had to take three days off because I was injured. But for the most part, it was pretty much a per perfect training camp, a damn near perfect fight week, perfect weight cut, and then pretty much a perfect performance. So I, I can't, you know, it was it was how it's supposed to happen. And I'm, you know, I feel like everything that's happening is supposed to happen the way it's happening. And I, I learned a cool cool word yesterday, um, pronoia, the opposite oh. of paranoia. So pro pro noia is like the universe conspiring for you and helping you. And I'm like, fuck, that sounds like my life. Like even hmm. the whole USADA situation, I, I was going into those fights and not healthy. My legs, you know, I needed surgery on my right hip. I, my, I just got surgery on my foot and it was not recovered at all. I couldn't run. I could hardly fucking walk. I had to tape it up before every practice. I'm um, going into that first fight against, um, uh, I think El Taco. Yeah. So I was like, I'm like going into this fight, not even healthy. I'd say I was like 40% healthy. Um, and then that happened. And so it's just, I feel like, uh, everything's happened how it's supposed to. And, you know, it's, it's, an, it's fun. Mm. You, you mentioned that you were sort of dealing with a couple of niggles, uh, going into your UFC 248 return. W were there any serious injuries that you were dealing with in that fight or? What what kind of stuff were you dealing with going no, into it? It was nothing nothing too crazy. Just let this shit everyone do. you know, everyone every fighter walking in there is dealing with something and mine was just another little something. So I feel I had both my feet taped up that fight. Um you know, my I feel like being a kicker, you know, you kick a lot, you kick a lot mm. of elbows when you're sparring and stuff and I just kicked someone's elbow really hard three weeks before you know, I, was, I, I couldn't walk for like three days. My foot was so fucking just in so much pain. But, you know, it died. The pain went away a little bit. It, it's still, I still have it. I'm going to actually get an x-ray and an MRI um, this week and just kind of see if, if there's anything wrong with it, if it's like a deep bruise or it goes from extreme pain to not so much pain. Like, I don't know. It's just weird. Our bodies are weird. But mm. like, like I said, going into the fight, I felt fucking so good. But every little injuries, so. Uh, here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd laugh if, like, you know, the, you, you're talking about this USADA thing as kind of like, it, you know, the silver lining that it allowed you to heal. And then it's like a pandemic comes. And it's like, well, the silver lining of the pandemic was that you got to heal you got <laughs> even more so. So it's just like silver linings in, in Sean's life all the way through, basically. Um, exactly. I was going to ask you, you know, you, you sort of, um, you spoke recently about wanting to kind of follow the, the Conor McGregor business model in a sense, just for those who sort of didn't hear it or, or may not have understood it, just explain it to us. What is it about sort of, I guess, his career and the way his career has been structured that you sort of look at and say, okay, that's something that's going to work for me? Yeah, I, I said that, then I didn't realize. So I, I read a couple comments, people like talking mad, like shit about it. I, I just think like, you know, as far as, the the level of opponents he fought leading up to, you know building his career it's, and look what he's at now it's just like he well i'm gonna probably get a co-main event maybe a main event for him fight night or whatever soon just like in that direction like he fought the dudes he fought and then he fought a main event and then he fought another main event then he fought a paper i don't know just like that kind of model so do you 
I, I, and as far as like, you know, quality of opponents, because I get the sense that you're not really in a rush. You're not in a rush to sort of, you know, go up and, and fight, you know, um, some of the toughest guys, you know, straight away. Not not to say the guys you're not fighting uh, are, are not tough, but in a sense, you're happy to just kind of progress your career, grow, oh, yeah. you know, build the skill set, right? Yeah, I mean, if it comes down to it and I had to fight the number one, number two, number three, there's no doubt in my mind that I can go out there and beat these guys. Like, it's not it's not a level. It's not like, uh, I don't think I'm ready. I'm ready to fight anyone. I'm just going to take a smart approach. If you're going to pay me 100000 to go fight number 15 or you're going to pay me 100000 to go fight number three, I'm going to pick number 15 all day. It's not it, – It's not. I feel like people are stupid. Like, I'll fight anyone anytime. time. It's like this fighting game. You don't you don't get a fight forever. You only get a fight for a certain amount of time. I'm not gonna start fighting the number three guy in the world right now because guess what? After I beat him, who do I have to fight next? The next toughest dude. So mm. I'm not I'm not in a rush to go fight the best guys in the world right now. Um, you know, some people might take that one way. Some people might take that another way. But I really don't care. I'm um, just, you know, you guys ask the question, I answer them. So I <laughs> I I'm a I'm not in a rush to go fight the next best guy in the world. Um, that's how super fights happen. You know, that the next prospect, they're going to, he's got to keep winning. Um, Nathaniel Wood was a prospect and he was, you know, saying he could, he'd fight and then he got knocked out. So, you know, it's just like, you gotta, they gotta, the pro, those prospects got to keep winning. I got to keep winning. And that's how super fights are made. So, mm. uh, I, and that's really what I'm going to be in for, at, you know, towards the later in my career. I want, I want big fights. I want super fights, but I got to earn those super fights. I got to keep winning. Um, I keep beating people and uh, keep getting highlight finishes to earn those super fights. And I understand that too. I'm not asking for super fights right now. I'm not trying to fight big fights right now. I got to, I got to, you know, work up to that. It's interesting that you bring that up though, because the, the, you mentioned uh, Woods and uh, there is a trend uh, for the UFC to push guys a little bit too quickly. We saw it happen with Darren Till, you know, he got pushed to a title shot. A lot of people believe very, very quickly. A lot of prospects go from the position of you know potentially being the biggest thing on the roster to eventually losing a few in a row and and possibly even losing their contracts right. do you do you think it, it's it's refreshing to see you bring this mindset into the game do you think it's something that a lot of people you know don't really think about as much as as when you just brought it up to us yeah well it's hard because when you're a fighter we'll use darren till for example he's in his mind he's the best in the world i can fight these top dudes i'm the baddest motherfucker in the world and it's like he so he goes and fights the baddest mother, and he loses now it's like okay now you lost two in a row and i you know it's like that so i'm just trying to be intelligent i'm trying to be i'm trying to be smart about it um I don't want to ever have to work a normal job in my life. I want this to be my full-time career. I want to make enough money to where I'm chilling. I'm good. I'm, I'm set. I don't have to do anything. Like I can stream all day, hang, you know, and have kids and like be able to be there full time. So I want to, I want to be smart. I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to fight the best. I'm eventually going to fight. I'm going to be the champ. Like I already know that it's going to happen. Like that's going to happen. That's already set. It's already going to be, you know, it's already real in my eyes. So I'm going to be the champ. I'm going to be having to fight the best dudes in the world at some point. I'm 25 right now. I don't need to be doing that right now. But it's going to be hard to deny me that when I, you know, I go out there and beat the next guy in a spectacular fashion. You know, it's going to be like, okay, we got we got to fight someone tougher. Mm -hmm. So then we fight someone tougher. But I'm not going to jump right now and say, I want this guy. I want that guy. I'm just going to take it fight at a time. How has the UFC been to you in regards to that? Because obviously you just made your day, uh, return back at UFC 248, so they haven't probably approached you with your next fight yet. But when they look at you, you know, they'd see money signs and they'd see the potential to have big co-main event fights on ESPN cards and try. I suppose a part of them would want to try and push you along as well. So what's your relationship going to be like with them when that comes around? And is that something that you've made clear to them already, that this is the kind of pathway you're looking at? Yeah, UFC, the UFC and people that work there are very, very smart people. They're not stupid. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, yeah, I think uh, we have I, me. I have a really good relationship with the UFC. It's like they see what I see in me. I've seen this since I was since I started. I've seen you know the before Connor was huge. Like I pictured me being that guy, and then Connor came up, and I was like, damn. That's sweet. Like, I want to follow that. Like, I want to be that big worldwide famous, you know, person 
So I think uh, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. And what it comes down to is winning your next fight. And how you do that is by con- being consistent in the gym. Um, I've been consistent in the gym for nine years. I'll be, I'll start, I'll be, I started when I was 16. I'll be 26 this year. So I'll be 10 years of consistent work. So I've been putting it in. Um, a lot of people just kind of recently within the last couple of years kind of heard of me, who I went, who I am, but I've been, I've been grinding in the gym for a long time. Um, my skill set is very high. I, I grapple with Tanquino, uh, Augusto Mendez, who just won ADCC worlds last year. The best grappler in the world. Uh, I train at the MMA lab with killers. Um, mm. I have a really, really good team around me. And I, um, like, like I said, it's just being consistent. So, it's interesting that you mentioned the the fact that you you know you kind of wanted to be big before the Conor McGregor hit that peak. A lot of people uh, in the roster they're just kind of I don't want to say they're copying what other fighters have done, but you know a lot of people are just kind of trying to go down the same pathway to become those big stars. And for a lot of them, it kind of falls flat because it's not who they are as a person, or it doesn't come off genuinely. Right. You know, I'm just wondering what 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 are, what are your thoughts on you know so many people trying to sort of push and sort of follow the, the same path to become big stars and sort of what was your, what's your reaction i suppose and advice to a lot of the roster that are sort of trying to copy the same thing to get out there <laughs> so, yeah some people just aren't meant to be i i feel like it's in me it's something it's something bigger than me it's like uh i don't know i feel like you know connor obviously has it some some people have it some people don't if you don't have it just you just keep fighting like just trade fight win fights and that's how you're gonna get you know you make your money but i don't know i feel like i'm i'm doing really good at just being myself being fucking goofy and just you know be being who i really am um and i think a lot of a lot of people can see that you know a lot of people especially if they listen to my podcast like tim and i have a co- podcast timbo sugar show you know i'm on there you know there's so many hours of listening to me talk you can get a good idea of who I am um because we're pretty you know pretty open on that podcast talking about life and stuff like that so yeah I'm just you know I'm a kid I'm a 25 year old kid and I just I'm trying to be myself and uh I love the <clears throat> I love the fight and I love this lifestyle that I get to live by fight by training and fighting and so I think some people just aren't meant to be superstars and then they try to be and it makes it look worse uh so I don't know. I don't really have advice for him. <laughs> uh, you, you just got to keep doing your thing. I think it was very telling also that, you know, you took such a long, well, not took, like, you were forced to take a layoff and then you came back after such a long time to such a massive reaction and just showed how much, you know, people were sort of clamoring to have you back. And I think that's kind of the sign of a star. I'm also, obviously, like you and Conor McGregor, or you on a Conor McGregor card sometime in the near future would be incredible. But you were obviously on 248, which was Israel Adesanya's card. You know, he's a guy that, you know, became a star in such a very short time. I'm just wondering if you sort of learned anything or observed anything, um, you know, with him, you know, being on that same card and maybe being around him on fight week. And he was bigging you up as well in the in the lead up to uh, his fight. Yeah, I mean, is he... Uh we're homies we don't i mean not we don't hang out or talk much but you know we have that mutual respect for each other um i know in his i think it was his debut when he fought marvin vittori he he said he watched one of my fights and and seen this 360 head kick i did and he said he he threw it in his fight from watching mine and he had never seen it before so that's pretty cool wow. especially being especially um his his background in, in kickboxing and, and stuff like that so he's like he's a fucking beast um, I like. I think he, hit me, and him have the best striking in the UFC, and I think that's why I'm such a. People really like to watch me. I'm not gonna go out there and lay like the fans, the casual fans do not. If you go out, Habib's different. He smashes dudes, but if you're mm. gonna go out there and take someone down, punch them a few times, control their hips, and don't let them up, like. No, nobody wants to see that. And that's just like <laughs> that's just the truth. Like no one gives a fuck about somebody that can go out there and take someone down. You know, unless you're a Damien Maya, where you're like, oh shit, he's gonna choke him. He's gonna take his back and choke him. That's what he's gonna do. Mm. So there's like a thin line between that that smash or that insane like he's gonna take his back, and then that guy that's gonna try to take you down. Score. I'm getting called out by all these 35ers. I've been called out by like nine people in the division, and some of them literally just try to grab you they're strong they try to take you down grab you and hold you like 
I'm not going to fight you. That doesn't even sound fun. If we have to fight, if it's like, okay, I'm the champ and you're the next guy, I'll fight you 100%. If you're the number one contender and I'm number two, I'll fight you 100%. But if it's just like, we're not, I'm not even in the rankings right now, I'm not going to fight you. That does not sound fun to me. Like, don't, you're, you got to be, it's got to be exciting. You know what I mean? Like, mm. that's what I want to be is exciting. And I feel like my style, I don't have to try to be exciting. I think that's just my style. It's just like, all my techniques are, you know, they're sharp, they're fast, they're, they're, they're some of them are flashy, they're, they're fun to watch, and they, the fans really, really enjoy that. Like, you go watch my last four fights, my contender series, my debut, on, um, Andre, and then my last fight, like, I'm, 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 they're fun to watch. Like, you, you watch them and they're fun. Mm. I think the other thing, um, I think the other thing, Sean, is also, like, I think, like, the whole stoner community, like, gets behind you as well. I think because, like, you're a young guy and you're a stoner, I think that's kind of, like, part of uh, what makes you... And obviously, there's been a lot of stoners and there are a lot of stoners in the UFC, but I think for you, like, it's such a such a big part of you. Even now, in the background, you got, like, all the cool, like, multicolored, like, tie-dye shirts and stuff like that. Um, and so you've got that whole community. I'm wondering, though... I've always wanted to ask you this, and now that you're on the show, I guess, perfect opportunity. When was the first time that you ever got high? What, what do you remember from that? And how old were you? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's it's funny, like, uh, there's two things from that. I'll answer that. I'm going to say this first, though. I mm. remember when I was kind of starting my social media presence, I'd take a video of me smoking or something, and uh, then I'd win a couple fights, and I was pro, and then I was talking about, and then we were looking at, like, okay, with UFC stuff, and I got told by so many adults and so many people, like, hey, dude, don't be posting that stuff. UFC's not going to mm. like that. Sponsors aren't going to like that. Don't be posting that. You know, my dad was was super, like, <laughs> telling me not to. People at the gym were like, hey, dude, don't. I'm like, dude, I don't care. If someone doesn't want to sponsor <laughs> me because I'm smoking weed, I don't, I don't want them to be a, want a sponsor. And that was kind of my mindset the whole time. Um and now it's it's funny Reebok made that that tie dye shirt you know it's obviously mm. pretty you know you get the idea of it and then uh, yeah even I think John Anik uh, in the fight during the fight said something about being a pothead this is funny how it's just like I feel like I can make I, I don't know I don't know. but the first time I smoked weed I think I was uh, 19 I moved down to Phoenix I was super against it my dad was a detective my mom was a nurse I got wow. raised like marijuana will kill you that's kind of the mindset i had like do not like i if someone was even smoking i would leave i would not associate myself with it um i was super against it and it's just how i was raised and nothing against my mom and dad they're you know they're doing their best doing what they think is what they need to do so i have no resentment against that um my mom still thinks it's the worst thing in the world and won't even talk to me about it like it's hard for me to have a conversation with her because I want to huh. open her eyes, be like, "Mom, it's not what you think it is." Because they made me think it was something else. Then I smoked for the first time. I think it was nineteen. Uh, <laughs> the first time I smoked, first time I got high because I smoked out of this vape pen, didn't feel nothing. But then the first time I got high, I think I took a bong rip. My buddy Tim and Frank, we were at the apartments where Tim and I lived here in Phoenix, and I, I remember fall, like passing out on this Xbox controller. It was on my side. It was the most <laughs> uncomfortable. But I couldn't – like I was awake, but I couldn't move. I'm like, what the fuck? This is so uncomfortable. I couldn't move the Xbox. I was laying on it. I just remember passing out for hours and waking up. And uh, I was like, that's it? That's what it was? That was awesome. So then I – you know, that's not that doesn't happen every time. It's just like I definitely took way too much from my first time. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think uh, that was the first time I got really high. Yeah, that was, that was good. Well, like, yeah, I, I guess it's like a, a two for one follow up question on that one. What would you sort of, it's funny how we change as people like you before uh, 19, you know, being so against it. And now like, it's such a big part of you. I'm wondering, like, do you kind of laugh when you, when you think about the old, you know, yourself, like the first 19 years of your life and, and the way you looked at it. And also, um, what, what would you say is sort of your favorite or funniest or, or wildest uh, stoner story? Yeah, I, I'd like to touch back on that too, is like when I was 19, even then, I probably was too. I, I'm super, super thankful I didn't smoke weed before I moved to Phoenix because I do think if I started smoking, I was 18, 17, 16, that young, I don't think I would have made it to Phoenix because that it, it's so easy to be able to take over your life. Like you could, mm. you could sit down and smoke weed all day and just be chilling. Like I'm not gonna do anything. Even still, like if I take a rip, 
right now I ain't doing shit the rest of the day unless it's a good sativa. Like it depends what kind too. Um, so I do think, you know, you definitely should be at least 21 before you start smoking weed and then just be very aware. It can, it can take over your life. It can control you. Um, you know, if you don't, I think you just got to be careful just with anything, just with like caffeine, even coffee. Like Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be drinking coffee past fucking 2 PM. You're going to be up all night. Like just, you know, it's just another tool. It's just another thing, like just like caffeine. Um, so I think you just got to be careful with when you use it, how much you use of it. Um, and then what was your, your oh yeah, the funniest I'll, moment, I'll ask, stone yeah, moment. Funniest, and, and by the way, I want to jump in there. I want, I want you to feel comfortable, Sean. So if, if you did want to like rip a bong or, or whatever, you're more than welcome to. This is, this is a safe <laughs> place, happy place. You're letting us into your home. But I was asking funniest or, or, or you know, just wildest uh, stoner story. Okay. Um, well, that's funny story. You know, it's got to be smoking with Snoop Dogg. I mean, you don't get much better than that. It wasn't funny. It wasn't necessarily wild, but I was smoking with Snoop Dogg. It was fucking, um, it was awesome. My buddy Casey Kenny was there. He was on the Contender Series too. Uh, he, so he was in the in the trailer. But yeah, after I, after the Contender Series, um, I knock out Alfred. I'm sitting in the back. They come in. Dana signs. So I just got signed by the UFC. Just had a fucking sweet viral knockout. Um, and now I'm smoking with Snoop Dogg in his trailer and it was, it, 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 nothing ever has felt like a movie. Like I was in a movie scene more than Mm. that. It was was funny. So it was, that that was probably the the coolest smoking moment or smoking with Joe Rogan on his podcast. We were smoking on his podcast. So, and that was fucking so fun too. So those two moments were pretty cool. Well, it's interesting, man, because you did mention Khabib before in his style, and this fight between Khabib and Tony Ferguson looks like it might still happen. I, I want to just go back to the possibility of the fight happening. There's apparently a secure location that Dana White doesn't want to let us know the whereabouts of, but I just want to get your perspective on this fight before we move on to your division. Um, it's a fight that we've been waiting for for a really long time. You're a guy that loves a great fight, obviously. Who do you think is going to win that one? I ha- yeah, I haven't, I haven't given a final prediction. Uh, I don't know if I just haven't thought about it enough or if it's just so hard to, you know, any fight, a street fight, it's hard to guess who's going to win, let mm. alone these two mm. black belts in MMA. So it's really, uh, God, it's hard. I feel like I have to really sit down and think about it. Even then, I feel like I'm not going to come to a perfect conclusion. So it's just so, so hard to guess. Um, is Habib going to be – be able to hold him down and just beat the fuck out of him or is tony gonna be able to lock something up i don't know that's that that's the question um it's either tony locks something up or habib smashes him so i i don't have a fight i don't have a prediction yet i don't know is the fight gonna happen we'll see like you said dana said he seems pretty sure that he had a location probably not gonna be in it can't be in america right i, I don't think yeah. it could be here you wouldn't think so Probably Russia, huh? Dana's backyard, know. maybe just a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, I, w- a I wish they could fight at the at the the apex. That doesn't make sense why mm. they can't. Mm. Yeah, that would be you know test twenty five people, to see if they're all corona free, and then ha- let them in there and you know get the lights and everything set up. That that, that should work. I don't know why it doesn't, but mm. everyone should just wear hazmat suits and fight in the hazmat suits. But let me just ask you <laughs> this. <laughs> Uh, because you don't have a prediction yet. Do you think Tony Ferguson is the most dangerous uh, opponent for Khabib in the division? The one that's most likely to possibly beat him? Oh, that's a good question. I think him or Gaethje, yeah. Either him or Gaethje got, got to be. You know, you got to count Gaethje in there too. He's a fucking beast. Yeah. I'm wondering, would you would you fight uh, like if you were in this position? I know you're kind of you know sitting pretty because like you had your fight, it's in the rear view, and now you're like, all right, cool, thank God that like we got it in before this pandemic. But if you were in these guys' position, you know this is so important for both of their careers. But it's a big risk, you know, given the climate that we're in. Would you would you be fighting now if you were Tony and Khabib? Like you know, given what's kind of you know on, on the line with coronavirus and all that stuff. Hundred percent. Wouldn't even think about it. Definitely, definitely would fight. Yeah, I'd fight even if they had fights at the Apex. I I text uh, Sean Shelby and I said, hey, if they're still fighting on the Apex in April and any fights fall through, let me know. I'd love to love to fight. So, but he said no. I think we're gonna get you in July. But yeah, I would definitely. I'd 
I don't care. No crowd, no no audience, doesn't matter. It'd be fun. Wait, so you're saying you hit up the matchmakers to, to fight, like, now? Like, in, like when, well, in when, April, when were you yeah, yeah, fighting? for that, okay. that April fight, that, that mm. same card with Habib and Tony, but they said that that card is still full, so that was a couple mm. weeks ago, so I don't know what's going on, but yeah, I'll probably fight, fight in July. So if, if the UFC called you up right now, they had a private plane ready in Phoenix for Sugar Sean and the crew, you'd still be down to do UFC 249 if things come, if, if that pops up? Was that four weeks? You got, a uh, less. you got what is it? I think less. I think I think we're looking at about three, three weeks now. Oh, yeah. I I could if they pay. Well, fuck, three weeks. That's a little push. <laughs> you and Tony four. Ferguson on the same card, Sean. I mean, Tony hitting some pre workouts. That would be <laughs> yeah. legendary. No, I don't yeah. know about three weeks. That might be. Like I said, I want to have a really smart career, and you know, I'm I'm I, I would want to have a at least probably, probably at least a month, at least three mm. weeks of work, and then the fight week. Well, I'll tell you what, man, before we go, just quickly, I just want to touch on your division because right now it looks like Henry Cejudo will be taking on Jose Aldo. Is that is that the, the Sugar Sean dog in the background right there? It sounds yeah, like the, the dog, the dog doesn't sound like a fan of the Aldo matchup between Cejudo <laughs> and Aldo. So I just... <laughs> no, he was... Uh... Oh. Yeah, look at oh, that. What a cute little rascal. Yeah, Pete. He don't like when I pick him up if he doesn't want me to. Ugh. No, yeah, well, it, Henry versus Aldo. When is that? Well, it was supposed to happen at UFC 250, um, but we don't know what's going to happen. That's supposed to be around June. So let me ask you, what do you think about Aldo getting the next title shot? And who do you think is the type of, tougher fight for Cejudo, Aldo or Peter Yan? Good question. Um, Aldo's coming off two losses, right? Lost at 45, then lost at 35. Mm-hmm. The thing, the cool thing about Dana White, and uh, I didn't wasn't necessarily a huge fan of the fight, just because he is coming off two losses. Dana's like, I don't give a fuck. I thought he won. I thought he beat Marlon, so I'm giving him the title shot. So I think you know that's, you got to respect mm-hmm. Dana. Dana the pimp. He just does it. He runs. He runs the show. So if he thinks he fucking won, then that that's fucking cool that he's not gonna let the judges. I thought Aldo won that fight too. Um, but coming off two losses, it is, it, that's what, I don't really care about rankings too much either. It's like the rankings are silly. They're, they're not, they don't really mean too much. Um, I think Henry, ooh, Henry versus Aldo, that's going to be a sweet fight. You know, I, Henry's a, Henry's, Henry's a beast. I think Henry could definitely beat him. Um, Peter, Peter would be a tough fight too. Um, Tougher, who's a tougher fight, Peter or Jose? That's good. Mm. That's a good question. I think. I think they're. Uh, I don't know. Probably. Oh, that's a good question. Probably Peter. I think. I think Jose might. He looked like he cut a little bit too much. Hmm. I don't know though. It's hard. It's, it's that's hard to say. I think both those fights are interesting fights. Does Peter have another fight coming up, or does he have anything booked? Peter. I mean, at, at, he I just think doesn't at the look moment, like a Peter. I think, at, yeah, at the moment, like no one really has anything booked. Everything that's is completely true. Up, he's up, up in fighting the, uh... the coronavirus along with all yeah, of yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good you point. UFC now. We'll, <laughs> we'll yeah. let you go, Sean, because uh, we could honestly chat to you for hours. You're a fascinating <laughs> guy, but we don't want to be too greedy with your time, so we'll get Thank out of here. But we'll sort of end it on this sort of. Once this pandemic is over, what is the ideal year sort of going to look like for you? I'm wondering how many times you, you hope to be fighting um, this year. I know you mentioned July. Is is there potentially a name that you have in mind? And also, I guess we'll throw this one in as a, a sort of double two-for-one combo question. What what are some of the things that you sort of are going to be doing and, and advice for people uh, who, are, who are stuck at home right now and, uh, and trying to take their mind off the coronavirus? Uh, yeah, July probably, and then... Um... You know, if I could fight three times this year, I'd be I'd be extremely happy. Yeah. Um, so July, December, July, November, some somewhere like that would would, would work perfect. Um, and then for the coronavirus, I think it's important to, you know, kind of structure your day and, and kind of stick to a routine if you're going to be stuck at home all day. You know, mm-hmm. put, if you if you want to schedule an hour, say I'm going to work out for an hour, that could be a 10 minute stretch, or it could be a 20 minute stretch, and then. 40 minutes doing some, you know, push-ups, kettlebells, pull-ups, just body weight things. If, um, and then, you know, write, block out an hour. Say, I'm going to read for an hour. I'm going to read and write for an hour. I'm going to do some, like for me, I'm going to do some breath work. 
Um, I, I worked out this morning. Uh, I think it's important to structure, have, a, have an idea of what you're going to do all day. And you could add journaling, meditation, breath work, all those little things that are going to improve your day and definitely mm-hmm. help with your anxiety. Because right now I feel like people's anxiety is extremely high, not knowing what's next, not knowing what to do tomorrow, not thinking about all these things like, oh, I don't have, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. Like, well, I haven't, I don't have anything to do. And just thinking like that's not going to help. So having little, little things to do, um, clean your house, just, just, you can find things to do all, all day um stretching you know you, you can definitely walk outside still i think you know take a bike ride um but for the the game the the gamers you can follow me on twitch sugar show underscore og uh, i've been playing i've been streaming like three or four hours a day hanging out nice. with uh which is super fun because i just sit here i play call of duty which is an awesome game um mm-hmm. uh, really into that right now and then the twitch fam the, the the stream's up and they're just sitting there talking you know it's 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 a lot of fun three, four hours goes by like that. So, um, that's what I do. I, I, I'm enjoying this quarantine. Like I said, with coming off that fight, I'm chilling. I'm, I'm good with whatever's happening. If we're, if we're locked down for three weeks, I'm, I'm good. Mm. A lot of wise wisdom from Sugar Sean, of course. I like, I love the whole Twitch thing, Ben. I reckon it's great because it's a way for people to still communicate with other people, feel like they're a part of a community and, uh, your Twitch channel is awesome. So make sure to check out that Twitch dot dot tv uh, forward slash sugar show underscore og and of course follow the man on twitter and instagram at sugar sean mma that's s-u-g-a sean mma for all the latest uh tony ferguson workout videos <laughs> sean, we, 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 listen man we could talk to you all day we appreciate you coming on and distracting uh, some people and giving them some positivity and some 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 advice and we look forward to what's next we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back on the program absolutely i'd love to come back on This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest was supposed to headline UFC on ESPN 8 against Jarzino Rosenstrike. First in Columbus, then at the UFC Apex. He is still the number two ranked heavyweight in the world. He joins us on the show for the very first time to talk about what's next. The Predator himself, Francis Ngannou. Welcome to Submission Radio. How are you, man? I'm good, man. And yourself? Very good, very good. And it's a momentous moment because uh, not only are you here to distract people in this time of need, but this is your first appearance on Submission Radio. Uh, it's, it's a special moment for us, Francis. We appreciate you coming on. And before we get into it... You won't be, be the meaning- last anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get into it, we've been meaning uh, to get your reaction to Joe Rogan breaking your power cube record, setting a record of 151,000 with a kick. We saw in January you tweeted that you won a rematch. What was your reaction when you saw Joe broke your record? I mean, uh, we all know that a uh, kick is always uh, powerful and hands. So, I mean, I was impressed because before Joe Rogan, I haven't seen nobody with that record on the kick, but... Um, Kick is always powerful than in hand. Yeah. So, yeah. If you did it again, if you did the rematch, would you be punching it or would you be kicking it, the old power cube? I don't know. I think I'll try some kick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, legs are very heavy compared to hands. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, Joe, if Joe Reagan is listening to this right now, you, you proposed a rematch. What is your message to him, and how would this rematch go? Well, <laughs> it's just a high cube. It's just a uh, ice cube, uh, man, and it's just fun. It's not, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not that important. It doesn't matter how it goes. It's still good. It's still cool. As long as I have to, I have to hang out with Joe. It's okay. <laughs> A few shots on the power cube and then Francis Ngannou on the Joe Rogan experience. I think that's that's what the people are, are clamoring for. But I'm just wondering, man, like you're sitting at home at the moment. you got a beautiful couch. Uh, it's it's crazy times at the moment. What have you been doing lately to sort of pass the time uh, as I, I imagine you would have been quarantined lately? Man, mm, it's kind of like crazy lately. What I have been, I've been doing, you know, just staying home, chair trying to do some home workout, but don't really have like motivation, mm. you know, yeah. <laughs> sleep, watch TV, 
watch movies, watch um, animals on TVs. What are you watching, Francis? What's a good movie or TV show that's popped up lately for you? Uh, who pops up lately? Mm. Mm, lately, I've been watching like, you know, I'm always a big movie watcher. So I watch like movies like um, the t- TV shows. Okay. Uh, American Heist. Uh-huh. Mm. La Casa de Papel. Oh, man. That's amazing. Um, TV shows like uh, I just watched the um, Working Date. It's a little yeah. bit like what's happening now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, I mean, it's kind of like funny because at first uh, you don't really believe it until you feel like until you get uh, you get there and you're like, okay, so this is true, mm. and <laughs> just keep evolving, evolving, you know. So I think at some point we're just gonna be, be uh, go out there scavenging for food as they uh, they did in the working date. This kind of like some sort of working date right now. It's it's crazy. Yeah. This is, I think none of us really expected it to be this big or go far, and then here we are. You know, all quarantined. I wonder what it's like for you, Francis, given that you were supposed to be fighting. Uh, you know, I believe. We're a few days away from when you're supposed to be fighting, and now you're at home. Well, how weird is that for you? Man, it's no matter how weird it is, you have to face the reality. The reality is something is going wrong in this world right now, and um, everyone has to um, settle, everyone has to sit down and try to. To do whatever you have to do to let it happen you know this one this time is not like it's someone fault mm. you know so yeah you just i mean it's not great it's not it could be like frustrating but if you think about it it's what is basically uh happening to every everybody everyone in the world so it's not just about you you know it's about the entire world yeah a very positive very mindset. Positive. Um, I just want to go through the uh, whole experience because first you were supposed to fight at the UFC Apex. The fight got moved. When did you find out the fight was going to be postponed? Did the UFC call you directly directly to tell you? How did you first find out? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, the UFC called. They called my manager. They didn't call me. But the time that they called my manager and my manager called me after, I saw that um, on social that the event has been uh, postponed. Yes, with all this, um, with all these cr- crazy thing, crazy things going on, you know, sometimes it's not like you you don't like uh, do it in the right way. You don't do it in the order or whatever. Everyone is trying to do whatever it can do as fast as possible and as good as possible. So yeah, I mean, it's the madness out there. Mm. Now, nah, definitely difficult times. I'm just wondering, did they mention uh, when the fight could happen? We know the UFC is looking to do UFC two. Uh, 49 with Khabib and Tony. Is there a chance he could be fighting on that card, or is it not uh, not certain when the fight would happen? Uh, there's a chance that I can be fighting in that card, but um, you know uh, they have to they have to settle everything down. You know, like for now, it seems like they have a location, but uh, they still have to double check and see how they're going to uh, handle this event safely for people because uh, first of all it's not just about they are not just expecting to go put people they're fighting they're also like uh, trying to make things um, to figure to care about um, our health you know yeah. so uh, i got tested they got me tested from the uh, covid 19 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I guess they tested uh, other fighters too, so which is kind of like a positive thing and like make you feel a little bit safe to get uh, to get uh, close or along with those people. 
Mm. When when did they <laughs> test you? Uh, we said a week ago. Was it the UFC or was it uh just like you went to the doctors? No, he was the UFC. Oh wow. Okay. Well, it's, it's good that they're actually I mean, testing for. I mean, he he was, he, he was the doctor, but through the UFC. Yeah. Well, that's good because originally they weren't testing fighters, so it's good to see that they are now. How would you feel if you were fighting a UFC 249? Would that be a good thing for you? Would you be you know concerned? Uh no. I mean, I won't be concerned because once again, okay, um, I don't want to say the COVID-19 is nothing. I don't want to say it's not bad, but technically I think it's just, I think it's a flu that we have all the time. The only problem with it is that it's contagious and it can uh, spread uh, very fast. And uh, yes, but no, I won't be concerned about it because yeah. I, even yeah. after the test, I wasn't very worried. I'm like, okay, how, whatever is it, it's going to be okay. It's not like bad because the, I think the thing right now is just the panic. So this thing has uh, caused more panic than the, um, um, than the real uh, pain himself, you know? Like, we are just panicking. We are panicking. Like, sometimes you think about it, and then I've, you're going to see. I mean, I saw people that ha- uh, has uh, cancer. I, was, I went to the hospital uh, last week to see some friend of my friend who was to the, at the hospital for the chemo, and he was there about to have a chemo, he was scared about the uh, coronavirus. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy times right now. Just going to mm. your opponent, I know you were supposed to fight Rosenstruck. Is he still the opponent that you would have if you were to fight UFC 249 or would it be a different opponent? Uh, I think it's to the, it's to the guy, it's to the same opponent if he get, if he's a uh, I assume, I don't know, I assume that he got tested as well. But um, yes, if he's well, yeah, I think he's, he's still the plan. I'm wondering, where, where, has to be, where, where would you be willing to travel uh, to have this fight? Because it looks like it's not going to be in the United States. Are you happy to travel to another country to do this fight? Uh, listen, as long as they figure out and uh, tell me that it's safe, yeah. I will travel. Hmm. I don't have any problem with traveling. Mm. Have Have they told you anything in terms of possible locations? I know Dana White said that he secured a location. Do you know mm-hmm. what the location is? No. I mean, even if I do, I wouldn't tell you, man. Oh, I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. <laughs> Talking to you. But let me, let me ask you know. this. Let me ask you this. Because it's, saying it's like a close disclosure. Yeah. People are saying the moon. People are saying Mars. <laughs> people are saying Russia. Could we rule Russia, the moon, and Mars out? Yeah. Well, I mean, anywhere, any, anyhow, it's going to be, I guess it's going to be somewhere on Earth. It's going to be on this planet. Juicy. <laughs> Juicy scoop. Exclusive. Francis, Francis confirms that it's going to be on Earth. All right, good. We can, we can use that. I'm just wondering, like, <laughs> what would it feel like for you to be fighting, you know, in uh, in in this scenario? Because the thing is, like, you've been away for so long and people have been wanting to see you back. And I know that for a long time, people felt that you potentially deserve the next title shot. So is this, I guess, the ideal scenario for you to be fighting? Because you were supposed to be fighting this weekend. And I guess in this case, at least your fight's still going on. Okay, so uh, talking about the ideal scenario, this is not an ideal scenario for anybody mm-hmm. right now. So nobody was expecting this thing. Nobody was prepared already for this thing. So then uh, if it's about to compromise and make things happen, yes, we will compromise and make things happen. You know, I don't think uh, the ideal scenario for the UFC was to be like three weeks away looking for a location uh, for for place the event. You know, that wasn't the ideal scenario. We just got uh, caught up 
and trying to find a solution to make this happen. Obviously, I haven't fought for a very long time and I really want to fight. But at the meantime, uh, it's not just because I want to fight. I mean, like, if I feel like I'm not safe, I won't. I want to be part of it, mm. but uh, mm -hmm. I'm just part of it because I feel like it's safe. Because nothing worth my uh, my hurt, you know. Uh, I'm just, I mean, I'm, 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 just I'm just wondering, Francis, training wise, like how how prepared would you be for this one? Because I know you, you mentioned just before, like you're at home, you're kind of stuck at home, and you're not feeling very motivated. Um, how where would you even be able to train to prepare for this fight uh, if you had to? Well, question. The problem is the same obstacle that I have right now. My opponent has the same thing. Mm -hmm. We all have the same thing. We all are in the same condition. It's not like he's somewhere training good in the gym, sparring, doing this, and I'm stuck here. No, we all are stuck. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's just going to be a, 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 a evil uh, misplaced. I'm just wondering as well, uh, is there a timeline where a cutoff date in your mind where you need to know for sure if you're fighting or not? I know we're just a few weeks away. When do you need to know for certain that this fight is going to take place? How far away from the fight do you need the UFC to confirm it for you? Uh, I mean, obviously, like uh, every fighter, you would like to know as soon as possible, like two months, like two, two, two months away, two months uh, from the fight, you know. But viewing uh, the uh, circumstances, you kind of like understand the situation. You kind of understand that they are trying, just trying to make it happen. You know, they don't. It's not like they have is uh, everything under control and don't tell you. You know, so I mean, it's just as I said before. It's just something that you have to um, be in or out, like. I compromise or I don't compromise. Mm. It's all about you. Would you want to be compensated <laughs> extra for sort of, you know, fighting in, in such a weird scenario and possibly having to fly to a brand new location on, on short notice? That would be my business between my manager and the UFC. Sure. <laughs> but nobody never say no for extra compensation. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 we appreciate the time, Francis, and it's so much fun having you on the program. Casper mentioned it before earlier in the show, and I just want to find out from you. If you do fight at UFC 249 and you do beat uh, Rosenstruck, do you believe that should automatically make you the next challenger for the heavyweight title? If this fight does happen, do you believe you should be able to fight for the title next? Okay. Well, what I believe is that, I mean... I might just be like um, a little um, too much, but what I believe is that I don't need to, uh, I didn't need to fight Rosenstruck to get the title shot. I believe I deserve the title shot right now, right where I am, even without this fight. Mm. So that's what I believe. But at the end of the day, it's not my call. Well, I was going to say, what do you think about the UFC? It looks like they're going to be making Stipe versus Daniel Cormier, uh, the, the trilogy. That's fight. what they say. Yeah. That's what they say. But the problem, the question is when. Mm. I, know, I know you've been away for quite some time and people can't wait to see you return at UFC 249, possibly. If the UFC do try to make the Stipe DC fight, would you consider fighting again just so you wouldn't have to take another long layoff? Or what kind of mindset do you have in terms of your activity if that fight does get made? Mm, willing to wait how long? That's the mm. question. Uh, who should I fight before that fight? How long is it going to take? So once again, uh, I said this is not my call. I'm just going to... I'm gonna fight, you know. Like uh, right now, I make I take my eyes off of the of the title of the title. So whenever it happened, it's happened. But it's not my my worry anymore. You know, mm -hmm. just want to stay active. Well, let's just quickly <laughs> touch on this fight uh, with the Rosenstruck that might happen at UFC 249. Obviously, he's made 
quite a name for himself very, very quickly, just like you, with uh, very devastating finishes and great performances. How do you see this matchup going if you guys do fight each other in a few weeks? How do you see this fight playing out? How do you see him and you matching up? Well, um, I think uh, he... He, he's not ready for this yet. He didn't know what he was calling, you know. And then when we're going to step there in the cage, then he'll find out that that was a mistake. But by the time, it will be too late for him. Mm. I think... So, uh, go, you go. No, you go ahead. What, I'm what, done. What, what did you think of, about his win over Overeem? Because that was kind of the big win that put him uh, on the map. But also, your win over Overeem was one that, you know, it'll, it'll live on in highlight reels forever. Were you, you, were you impressed by him in his Overeem fight? No. I mean, I don't think uh, anybody who watched that fight was impressed by him because he lost the entire fight. Mm. Like, uh, minute by minute, he lost the fight. If we have about to score minute by minute, he lost the 24 uh, minutes until the last the last minute. He, I think that was a lucky shot. Like, he gave it all at one to see how he, he plays out, and he caught him. Also, he still, have, he still had a luck that the referee uh, stopped earlier because with four seconds left, Alistair wasn't, like, uh, out. He was still fighting. So that was a... Uh, lucky win for him which is far from something that could could have impressed uh somebody and me again mm. well you you've obviously <laughs> fought some of the best guys in the world and you've already fought the champion steep and uh for the belt so when you look at rosen strike and obviously coming off that overeem win where does he rank as like one of your, your toughest opponents okay so this is the thing um everyone that i faced that i have to face, um, I consider all them tough because as soon as you start to think like someone is less tough uh, than another one, I think that's a mistake. So I can't be able to answer that question. Every fight, I mean, every upcoming fight, you probably have to think about the, uh, your opening, like the toughest challenge that you ever heard. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's interesting because whenever people fight you, obviously that first round is so dangerous and people say that, you know, they're going to take you on, but then we see they try and avoid obviously getting hit by you and, and they, they try not to meet you in the middle of that octagon. Do you think Rosenstruck will try and avoid getting hit and getting into a battle at the start of the fight and will try and drag it out? Well, how do you think he's going to try and approach it? Or do you think he's going to go in there with the full mindset of trying to stop you early? Uh, I think uh, he's hyped up, and right now he truly believes in himself. So, and he truly, like, he has a, his confidence right now, full, his full cup confidence. Mm. And uh, mm. I wouldn't be surprised if he walked, like, after, straight to me, to attack, to control the octagon. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised. I think that's exactly kind of what, what people, you know, hope for if they see, you know, you and Rosenstrike sort of meet in the middle and uh, and throw down. I really appreciate the time, Francis, and we'll let you go in a moment. But before we do, I just wanted to ask you what you think about John Jones potentially coming up to heavyweight because this is something that people have been expecting for a long time and um, it seems like it's on the cards, you know, eventually. And obviously, if he does come to heavyweight, uh, there's guys like yourself and Stipe that he'll be, he'll be facing. So how well do you think John Jones could do in your division? Uh, I think John Jones could do where, wherever he, he goes, wherever, wherever he want to be. Mm. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Like when you look skill-wise, uh, fighting experience, everything, there's no doubt that he's, he can do uh, well everywhere. I guess from your perspective, do you do you feel like a guy like John Jones could be a challenge for you? Because especially, I, f I think in the striking, people find it fascinating. Yeah, of could be challenging for you. Um, 
Yes, John John is a challenge for everyone. Obviously, I would put myself as a winner, but <laughs> if you if you don't take John John as a challenge, that means something something's wrong with your. That means you, you're crazy a little bit. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this guy has been uh, around and has been beating people up, being charm, been through all type of fight uh, over years and years, and stood there in the top position. Like, and if you don't take it as a challenge, that means uh, you get it wrong. Hmm. All wrong. <clears throat> if you if you and John Jones were in a fight, what what would do you think would be sort of the most dangerous aspect? Of John's fight, and and as far as the size, how much of a of a difference maker do you think it really makes? Um, I haven't think about that because right now I'm heavyweight. John John is like heavyweight. Uh, before then, I just get like trying to focus about what's going on in the heavyweight. Maybe if John John step up in the heavyweight, then I will start to be concerned about him and like studying studying him mm. but right now mm. no i don't really think about it mm. there's yeah. bigger fish to fry <laughs> while we're talking about uh dream fights at heavyweight uh we got to bring up tyson fury i ha we have to get your reaction what did you think about his big win over deontay wilder impressive. just recently i mean very impressive but uh i knew that he's gonna when he's going to knock Tyson Fury out. Uh, he's going to knock um, Wilder out, my bad. Because, like, the way that he shows up, like, when you look the first fight, you can understand that uh, Tyson Fury kind of, like, get the first fight and to settle, uh, to figure out how to fight uh, Wilder. Because the guy is very smart. I mean, uh, Fury is very smart. And then when he came at the weigh-in, uh, heavier than before, it was just easy to understand that he'd been putting a lot of work in the power, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, strengthening himself to knock the guy down because he has uh, everything to knock him down. He can cut him anytime. Mm. So, yes, that was very impressive, like, uh, to take Walder and beat him like that, man, it's something that never happened yeah it, it was a great it was a great performance a lot of people obviously think that deontay wilder has the strongest power when it comes to uh boxing i'm just wondering what do you think of deontay wilder and, and his power punch and obviously we know you're the you're the hardest hitter in mma who do you how, how do you think the power matches up in mma compared to the power that deontay wilder throws I know you, you set records everywhere. You're like the Deontay Wilder of MMA. People believe you have you have the biggest power in MMA. I mean, I don't really know, and we can we can't really know exactly like uh, what is the matchup like because uh, in the heavy, basically in the heavyweight division, like when you're like even the average fight, uh, power man in the heavyweight division, if he's connect you, you go down. Mm, yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, if you're like half more power and then connect somebody, he goes down. If they want while they connect somebody, he goes down. If I connect, he goes down. So you can really manage that. Mm. Obviously a massive performance from Tyson Fury. I know, I know you want to take Tyson Fury on eventually. It's a fight that people want to see. And we heard that Mike Tyson is apparently going to be one of your trainers if that fight does happen. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is Mike Tyson, would he actually be one of your coaches if you fight Tyson Fury? Definitely. We spoke about it and that was very clear. Mm. Like, um, because I'm, I really... Uh, I, I really think about to like um, do, go back, do some boxing matches. Mm. Obviously, Mike Tyson is an absolute legend. I'm just wondering, have you trained with him yet at all, or is this something that's that's going to happen? And no, why no did Mike? Sorry. No, not yet. Not yet. I'm just wondering what 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 would it mean for you to train with a guy like Mike Tyson, one of the biggest legends in boxing. 
I think you mean the same thing uh, to every to everyone. It's very like uh, um, it's one of the greatest of all the time. Like to have a chance to be there with him. You know the guy that you've been watching on YouTube, how he fights. To be there in the same uh, locker room or in the same gym, like listening to him coaching you. I think it's just something unbelievable. I kind of like picture it. Like to, even when I was with him, he was showing me something, uh, some some trick. Then I'm like, so this is real. I'm here with Tyson, with Mike Tyson, like for real, you know. So it's kind of like great. Would you want him in your corner <laughs> if, if you fought Tyson Fury? Yes, that's what I said. Oh wow, that that would be incredible. I'm just wondering, what 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 is it about the Tyson Fury fight that interests you so much? Uh, he's the best. Mm -hmm. We don't have to. Um, we can argue that he's the best. He's the uh, biggest challenge ever regarding boxing, and also remember he was about to cross over to come to MMA to the UFC and fight me. That's how he came out. That's how this all started. He said he wanna cross over, come to the UFC and fight. Then <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I take I'm willing to take the challenge and I can return you the favor in the ring. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna beat him in the octagon, definitely. Because it's, it's a give him the rematch in the ring. Yeah, because it's an interesting situation because he spoke about wanting to do the crossover fight. And I'm just wondering, are you open to fighting him in MMA and boxing? Or would you be open to fighting him in boxing first and then possibly fighting him in MMA? What's your th what, what are your thoughts on it? It's the same thing. I mean, MMA and boxing or boxing and MMA, at the end, it's going to be boxing and MMA. It's going to be both together. And we, we do appreciate your time. We'll let you go and just want a couple more questions. But just when it comes to MMA and the punching power and obviously, you know, the glove size and the differences that it makes, you know, how do you see the Tyson Fury making the crossover to fighting you in MMA with MMA gloves? Do you think he understands how hard it is and, and the differences and, and, and the advantages of being in MMA? Do you believe there are advantages in, 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 in MMA compared to boxing that he doesn't understand yet? Yeah. Definitely. It's two different sports, two different uh, experiences. Absolutely. Well, listen, we are very honored to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Crazy times right now, guys. Francis Nagani, you can follow him at Francis underscore Nagani on Twitter, Instagram at Francis Nagani. And of course, he may or may not be fighting at UFC 249. For now, he graces us with his presence and distracts us from what has been a stressful week in everybody's lives. Francis, we do appreciate you, and thank you so much for coming on to Submission Rate for the first time. First thank time. you, guys. See you next time, then. And there you go, guys. Uh, a somewhat terrifying Francis Ngannou. Uh, maybe <laughs> kept him on the line a little bit too long. I know he's probably got better shit to do than to chat to to us guys. I think yeah, I, I understand it. You know, he's got this crazy thing going on with UFC 249. You know, he's not really feeling motivated to train. And I guess we're talking about things like 60,000 years from now. But I guess from our perspective, we want to have a bit of fun and, and, and get some fun things out there for you guys. You know, everybody wants a good distraction. So we thought, hey, Mike Tyson, Tyson Fury, John Jones, fun topics to talk about. But yeah, maybe maybe kept him on a little bit too long. Yeah, I'll tell you what though, that Tyson Fury fight, if he if he ever does make a crossover to MMA, geez, it seems like a great matchup to have for for the UFC and for everybody to look at. Man, but with that, I, I was yeah. gonna say, I just want to see like a, a behind the scenes thing with like Ngannou and Mike Tyson interacting. Yeah. You know that that needs its own like countdown and and embedded. And I, I just I don't know. I want to like once maybe. You know, if a Tyson Fury or whatever fight ends up happening later on, I want to see them like drilling stuff and, and discussing techniques and stuff. I just think that would be so fascinating. Yeah, Mike Tyson is a guy that um, if anybody listens to his podcast, he has so much knowledge when it comes to boxing. It's unbelievable mm -hmm. because I think a lot of us just remember him for the trash talk and the unbelievable knockouts. But this guy is a technician, so I would love to see the kind of stuff 
that he would add to Francis's game. And by the way, just a quick shout out to Mike and the Hot Boxing crew because they did a episode with Eminem that just came out this past week, which is definitely something that should be on your binge list. It's a lot of fun and people should check it out. Eminem, a submission radio favorite as well. Just quickly, Cass, before we wrap up as well, while we're talking about binges, mm. I know a lot of people are looking for things to check out. I'm just going to quickly list a couple of things that I've checked out recently that you guys can check out as well. Check out Jojo Rabbit, which is a really interesting movie. You and me actually watched that one with our friend Oscar from The Mac Life in, in the States, but I gave that one a rewatch. Definitely recommend it to everybody. It's about, it's kind of like a dark comedy around Hitler and sort of uh, got Scarlett Johansson. And, you know, it's, it's just a very, very smartly done movie. There's also another one called Richard Jewell, which I recommend people check out. It's hmm. a Clint Eastwood movie. It's out right now. The Jay and Silent Bob reboot. That's just perfect for a binge afternoon session. It's got a lot of people like Chris Jericho, Matt Damon. Oh, wow. Ben Affleck. Yeah, all sorts of people. People can check that out right now. For those people that love their anime, or anime <laughs> uh, Superman Red Sun is a new movie that just came out uh, from DC that I'm looking forward to checking out. I haven't checked it out just yet, but really good reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Cobra Kai Season 2. I watched Season 1 thanks to you, Cass. You put me onto it. and Dude, Season 2 is, is off the chain. I love it. I'm addicted to it, and I'm wow. already depressed because i only got a few episodes left to go midway is a movie about pearl harbor that was redone they didn't have the money for cgi so it's a little bit crappy but it's kind of good in a crappy way and exactly what people need for a binge session when they got nothing to do 21 bridges is a movie uh with a guy from black panther which wasn't the best but still again in that category of like you just sitting around, you want something fun that you don't have to think about. It's definitely something you guys can check out. And you know what? Tom Hanks, he's down here in Australia. He had the coronavirus with his wife. But I have to say, um, that movie, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, unbelievable story, man. I looked into mm. it. A lot of it is true. You guys should definitely check it out. And I also watched Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo and, and Tim Robbins, a, a movie that's important to watch, but was super boring and not something that I... <laughs> recommend uh, and just quickly as well um curb your enthusiasm man i feel like these guys are just knocking it out of the ballpark this season alone uh, you know he gets celebrities to be in the show cast this season alone you got people like clive owen you got people like um vince vaughn oh, wow. you got people like uh, M- mila kunis jonah hill all these people making Yum. cameos on the show and, and a ton more it's act. Uh, I don't want to say it's the funniest it's ever been because the last couple of seasons have been on point. But if you want a distraction from this craziness that's going on, I definitely recommend check it out. If you haven't seen the earlier episodes, man, you're in for a treat. There's a lot of stuff to check out as well. And uh, for those people that kind of get sick and tired, I've been playing brain training on Nintendo Switch Cast as well. Mm. Something that's been keeping me sharp. A weird game that you wouldn't think would be fun. But it's fun. Definitely something. I'm, I'm looking forward to checking out Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat 11. This week, I want to pick it up and play it on the PS4. So just a few recommendations, people out there that are just wondering what they should check out. Mm. We should definitely get Mila Kunis on the show. I think um, <laughs> I think, uh, think we'd be great together. Um, but yeah, no, I think uh, t- give us your comments in the comment section below about what you guys are doing to pass the time in this uh, you know, yeah. quarantine, this coronavirus. I feel like, uh, you know, you playing brain training on the Switch, it's like it's something that you would not have done if you weren't kind of stuck at home. So I'm just curious to hear what kind of wild activities people are doing out of out of sheer boredom and shit they're trying to do that they've they've never really done before uh you know what you forgot though uncut gems with adam sandler Ah, yes great movie as well what a great movie i i have not been on the edge of my seat uh for anything since i watched breaking bad which by the way breaking bad jesus i haven't seen the sopranos laugh if you will but for me breaking bad is the best tv show i've ever watched i was i was like a lot of people i think you guys maybe can relate where i watched the first two seasons and you're a bit like oh man it's a good show but it's kind of slow it's a bit eh, it's a bit of an investment and then just from there on like uh, years later it was actually like maybe a few months ago uh, I was on a holiday and I got sick in Bali and then continued watching Breaking Bad because people put it on. I got so addicted. It was it, it was my heroin. <laughs> I just like, oh my God. I came back from the You guys the trip. would be hanging around watching it, right? Dude, it's like, it's like, it's like what did you do you in guys... Bali? Well, we watched a lot of Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's a, it's a great, great show. Look, while we're talking about streaming, uh, Spencer Confidential is the new movie with Mark Wahlberg. It's pretty crappy, but it's got like Cowboy Cerrone and stuff in oh, it. Yeah. So you guys can check it out. That's streaming right now. The Boys on Amazon is something I've been checking out. Superhero has gone bad so that's something interesting hunters the first tv show al pacino's ever done is on amazon as well so dude d- the only show i really really hate is that this is dating in the dark show that i know a lot of people have been watching man that that thing is a piece of crap but again whatever it ne- whatever it takes to distract us 
Uh, it's out there. You like, it, you like right a bit now. of maths, don't you? Marriage at first sight. Oh, dude. Yeah, I, I do parties. <laughs> I've had to restrict them to 10 uh, people. Terrible season this time around, but, you know, I'm following them all on Instagram and we'll just have to we'll have to get them. You see, it would be great to see them fight each other. This, this mm. is the, Forget the UFC, Tony Ferguson versus Khabib. Put a little bit of Poppy and Josh versus each other in a cage. There's a bit of stuff to be figured out there. But I was going to say, uh, videographer Christian, mm. you mentioned The Sopranos. You know, he's been on us to watch it properly, and I know he'll be uh, he'll be messaging us going, why are you guys mentioning all these shows and not telling everybody to check out The Sopranos? I promise we'll do it. I just got to do it. We just got to do it, Cass. I think it's going to get to the point where we just sit down and force ourselves to do it. But, of course, The Sopranos is a great show. Friday Night Lights is a great show. A lot of great shows out there. Def- but I think, dude, I think the key is stay away it's important to keep up with the facts i mentioned it at the start but um you know definitely disconnect from the media because at the end of the day a lot of these media ch- channels they're just trying to get your clicks they're trying to get, keep you tuned in through panic and anxiety i know a lot of people are calling the lifeline right now definitely do that if you're feeling anxious but once you know the facts disconnect and trying to make the most of the situation of the rough situation we're all dealing with we're here with with you we're here for you and it, no, oh, dude, I'm just happy, Cass. Six year anniversary. It's it's cool to provide some entertainment for the people so they can take their mind off what's actually going on. Yeah, totally. I mean, ultimately, it's your decisions that are going to make the biggest difference, right? Not so much your your attitude. So, like a person at home who is stressing, freaking out, riddled with anxiety, is not going to be any more safer than a person who is also at home quarantined, um, but just kind of you know watching TV, enjoying things, and you know having a laugh. And I I know, I know it's tough because we're all worried, you know, about financial things and job things and paying the rent and all that kind of stuff but um yeah try try we're hoping that things like submission radio and us being in your ear can kind of take your mind off these things for a little bit and give you a little bit of joy and happiness and uh, we know that we're not the only ones also just quickly final thing before we wrap uh, obviously because we thanked a lot of people in our six year anniversary got to thank our videographers as well because it, it isn't just us when we do go to these events it's our videographers that probably work harder than anyone people like you know christian sacchini justin alaya uh edris toussaint uh you know even abby abby siobhan uh, who, who did ufc 244 with us um i always feel like i'm forgetting someone have i forgotten someone christian justin edris abby earl, earl, earl mcmillan in the early days yep doing the thing but that's it checking it out, checking it out yeah and as we wrap up guys of course ridge.com forward slash submission for your 10 percent off your ridge products definitely check them out we appreciate them working with us and being a sponsor of the program with that that is it for submission radio six year anniversary be kind out there guys help each other out stay positive and we will be back with another episode of submission radio next week